Welcome to the Coffee with Kareem podcast. This is Kareem Sirajuddin. In this episode, I got to speak to the amazing Peter Gould, who is calling in from Australia. A new tradition I'm trying to incorporate in my shows is to ask the guests five fun questions at the beginning of our conversation. Just so the audience knows, there are still several shows that were recorded last year, in 2017, which did not have these five fun questions, hence why you may notice there won't be consistency for the next couple of months because those shows still need to be released as well. But I did wanted to let everybody know in case they were wondering about that. If you would like to submit questions to my guests, fun or serious, please join our exclusive community today at patreon.com slash coffee with Kareem. Thanks again for tuning in to the Coffee with Kareem podcast. Peter Gould calling in from Australia. And Peter just got his coffee and is chilling in a cafe. So I just wanted to say thank you, Peter, for having coffee with Kareem for real. Because sometimes people don't actually have coffee. (laughs) Hey, thank you. No, I definitely got it. They're just making it right now, actually. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to having a chat with you. Thanks for having me on. Exquisite, exquisite. So for those of us that don't know, Peter Gould is a celebrated designer, creative entrepreneur, and artist. He has won several awards, launched his own apps and games, created popular online platforms, teaches workshops internationally, and has worked on and published several books. Thank you so much again for for being on the show, Peter. I'm a huge fan. Alhamdulillah, thank you. Really great to be with you. And yeah, that that bio sounds like it was written by a a, a, a copywriter who's trying really hard to make me look good. And then they actually have coffee with me, and you know, I'm just a regular guy. But it was, uh, but that's cool. I'm really, um, I'm really happy to be on with you, and look forward to learning a bit more about you as well, inshallah, and like your other guests. Mashallah, my pleasure, man. Hey, all amazing men and women started off as regular men and women. <laughs> yeah, and the best, the best ones, <laughs> the best ones stay that way, right? They never forget it, right? I mean, I was, um, I was just with someone, um, yeah, like just, just recently, Masha sold these company to Airbnb and, uh, you know, doing very well, very successful. And I was just, you know, literally he was making me coffee and was just chilling out and, you know, he put love and time into building that. I was like, this guy's just so chilled and humble. And yeah, so, um, these are the, this is why we need to have conversations like this to, you know, keep each other kind of in check. I, I love it. Absolutely. And next time you're in the Bay Area, you have to have Kareem's homemade coffee as well, because that's pretty well known from my circle. So you don't want to miss out. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. No, I'd love to check it. Although I will say Australian standards of coffee are pretty high and pretty, we're kind of notorious coffee snobs. Um, so, you know, I, uh, you know, you have, I'll definitely, you know, definitely love to try that out. But, you know, if you send any Aussie to come visit you, then, um, yeah, they'll be, they'll be watching you with great, great interest in detail. Don't worry. I won't, I won't be pulling out Folgers crystals or anything like that. We're going to be doing it proper. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter, you're, you're actually the first, um, recording for 2018. So I want you to know how special you are. Thank you very much. One of the things I'm going to be doing this year, inshallah, is incorporating Kareem's fun five questions to kind of warm up the guests before we get into our conversation. So are you ready for your five fun questions? I have coffee in hand and I am ready. Bismillah. Bismillah. All right. So first question for you, Peter. If you could live in any point in time in human existence, it could be in history, it could be today, or it could be the future... Where would you want to be? Oh, man. Can I answer two? Okay. So one is, uh, maybe it's a little bit of a cliche, but probably in Granada in about maybe 1300, um, sort of, you know, the whole Andalusian experience, the heights of culture and arts and, and design. That that would be one. Um, Andalusian, you know, southern Spain. Um, or And my second one would probably be in the, the Muppet Studios with Jim Henson in about yeah. probably the sometime in the 70s, you know, creating fun stuff for kids and, you know, creating experiments with new technology. So either of those two things I'm cool with. Brilliant. Love that response. Okay, let me ask you this. If you had to be on an island and you only had one record or one CD, or who would you be your favorite musical artist or band to take with you to, to listen to? Oh, uh, man, that's tough. That's If just one is so unfair because, you know, you need to... I'll, I'll give you two. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Well, depends if I'm alone or not, but uh, one of them would probably be 
um, Jeff Buckley's Grace, you know, all time kind of classic. Beautiful choice. Yeah, just really, you know, very, because I'd probably be lonely and emotional, and that's just a very powerful kind of album. And, uh, you know, there's so many others, but um, gosh, where do I start? I, I think, um, let's leave it that, because then it's going to be unfair to everyone else. We'll go with, we'll go with, we'll go with Jeff Buckley. I think that's a brilliant choice, man. He's a great musician. Question number three. How about if you could only eat one carb for the rest of your life, which one would you have to choose? <laughs> oh, God, these questions. I thought you said these are fun questions. These are like... these are, <laughs> Aren't they fun? The, I'm having yeah, fun. <laughs> these are challenging. Okay. Um, okay, how about we go... If it's just one, how, how about we go, we go some banana bread with a lot of butter and like super, you know, super oily kind of banana bread because that's it oh wait 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 you misunderstood you can you can choose categories like it could be bread rice pasta okay straight up breads that's it i'm a bread guy so yeah uh, actually that would be my choice yeah, too so choice. We're, we're on the same page there definitely question number four what's one way you feel you gift the world well alhamdulillah yeah, i mean uh i'd say i and I'll, this will probably be three as, as we chat but um i definitely get a lot more gifts than i give but if I am, I'm trying to, in the last couple of years, do design and creative workshops for, for young people, um, particularly in Muslim communities, to really um, inspire a sense of, of design and creativity and imagination and potential. So that giving young kids, um, you know, their, their understanding that they can change things through design and through, you know, their creative um, potential. So... I don't know. I'd pick that one. It's it's probably cheesy, but uh, that's uh, yeah, that's probably what I'm trying to do. Well, who doesn't like cheese? I mean, I'm a huge fan <laughs> of cheese. So. <laughs> it would be cheese and bread if I had to choose. The only two things I could eat would be cheese and bread. So there's nothing wrong with cheesy. <laughs> cheese on toast. Yeah, well, that's it. And and then and I guess the most direct way I'm trying to do that, of course, inshallah, is with my own children, and give them their um, you know, you know, encourage them on their creative potential. So yeah. Allah ya barak fiqa. Beautiful work. Beautiful. Okay, so since these questions haven't been that easy and fun for you, I'll I'll make a deal with you. You get to choose which one you want to answer next. You have one more, okay? Yeah. So one question is, if you could have one superhero power, what would it be? And the second question you can choose from is, if you could be any animal for a day, which one would you want to be? Ah, uh, these are great. I feel like I'm going to have such cliche answers, though, because... I mean, we're, everyone's going to pick invisibility, right? The, come on, that's like the, mm, you know. You'd be surprised. Really? You'd be surprised. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, I feel like, I mean, maybe that's the most nefarious because you can get up to all sorts of creative activities if you're invisible. Um, but I, I think uh, in the second one, I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to go with being an animal and I'm going to go with being an eagle. Probably cliche, but just being able to like soar around and see all of the majesty at such that grand scale of this world and then zoom straight into like a detail and be able to pick up like, you know, a fish from like the little tip of a wave and then have a snack. Like, uh, come on, that would be amazing, right? It would be, yeah, for sure. So yeah, I'm, I'm going with that. Remember, there's no right or wrong answers. It's just about being creative and, uh, and getting your brain running. So I hope that did the trick. That did. And I think this coffee's helping. So I've, I've chosen, <laughs> chosen to go with an almond milk cappuccino here. Um, for your listening pleasure, and uh, it's very tasty. I've been trying to cut back a little on the, the, the full cream milk, as we call it here in Australia. I don't know if it's the same, but um, yeah, almond milk. So it's uh, so far so good. Mashallah, delicious. Now, Peter, why don't you tell us more about why you do what you do? Yeah, sure. So um, without giving you the whole the whole spiel and the sort of whole background on on how I got into design and, and, all, and my whole childhood in design and all that kind of stuff. I think um, I just, I've become more and more over the years um, aware of the potential for design as a tool for change. And design not just in the sense of like making something look a certain way or creating a certain graphic or product, but you can change a lot through having a sense of, you know, design is your you know, creative potential for changing one problem to something better. And, you know, that's, that's really our human potential is we, we design things forward. We're in this constant state of changing things, um, trying to improve things, trying to fix things, um, and, you know, opening our you know, new horizons with our, you know, imagination. And design is the means to actually make that change. So, um, yeah, I, be, I just really become excited about that and trying to, I guess, encourage others to do that 
particularly in Muslim communities or Islamic economies where I've uh, spent a lot of time in the last 10 years um, and, and seeing that, that how, how badly we need design as a, as a tool, as an agent to help us grow, you know, grow communities and, and make positive change and bring things into much better states through that creativity, imagination, and then design to, act, you know, to actualize some of these changes that we, we imagine. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that's probably a, a, the biggest driving why. And it also just, you know, trying to do something positive on while we're on this earth for a short while and, you know, being accountable for all these blessings and gifts we have, trying to use that for, uh, you know, in whatever capacity we can to do something good, inshallah. Right. Now, would you say, like, you know, being a designer is similar to, like, let's say an engineer where you're trying to come up with solutions or is it a little different than that? So, like, design, if you take in the, I take the sort of the, the broadest definition, which is, is, is really about change is that, you know, we all have that potential for, for design within us. So, you know, someone who's really, um, you know, an incredible uh, surgeon maybe have a potential to be a strong designer because they look for opportunities, they see the problems, and they might go off and say, hey, let's design a better workflow or way to, you know, approach this challenge. Or the engineer, of course, is probably more directly to what we associate with things like product design or software design, um, you know, who may be the ones doing the nuts and bolts of actually making that thing work. Uh, and they, of course, would, you know, um, you know, need to have, you know, more and more, they're required to have stronger senses of design. And uh, I guess what, what I'd encourage people to think about, that design isn't just the, the sort of graphic design or the visual design or interior design. It's not making things look pretty, although that can be designed to, to, to create a certain emotional response through the way something looks and feels. Um, so, so, yeah, there's a, there's a strong parallel around all of those things. Got it. So, so the aesthetics is a, is a facet of design, but you wouldn't say it's the essence of design. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just one part of it. So, for example, let's say your um, Tesla or, um, you know, th they've identified that, you know, we have a huge problem with fossil fuels and with, you know, um, you know, and people want to be able to have ways to get around without burning the planet's resources. Um, and they also want to, it has, it has to look cool and be affordable and all those things the same way that they would have expected the last, you know, 50 to 100 years. So you have a brand like Tesla coming along where they need to design that whole experience. So they're designing um, not just the, you know, the engines and the products and the physical thing, but also the brand around that, you know, the association by getting, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger to drive one and whatever, you know. Have, so you designing the whole emotional connection um, the, a famous designer, uh, Hamoud Eschlinger, who founded, um, you know, worked on some of the earliest Mac computers with Steve Jobs in frog design. He talks about a concept of form follows uh, emotion, right? So which is you don't just design to make something work, but, you know, you design um, something to evoke a certain emotional response that you want. And so I think maybe a brand like Tesla are doing that well or... Um, you know, there's probably lots of other examples in, in software, maybe, you know, people that use Uber, um, you know, they experience a certain type of, uh, you know, personality as they go through that experience. It's more than just like, oh, let's hop in the car and go. You know, like for a while there, it felt like the people doing that were um, a little more like, you know, this is a, a pioneering type thing they're doing or they're sort of early adopters. And, and, and uh, yeah, so, so design plays a role all around us. Everything you see and everything we have around us was just an idea that someone then designed into into reality, which I think is a pretty cool way to, to start looking at the world if you want to learn about design. Absolutely. No, that's great. I mean, what came up for me is also, you know, as someone who's studied philosophy and theology and different things, there's a very common concept in, you know, philosophy, ontology of essence versus form. Right. And so the essence, let's say, is I want the essence of this product to be for people to feel this way or to experience this thing. And then the form must follow and reflect that. So I, I love how you reminded us of that, that you have to start first with this kind of root um, purpose. And then the form has to follow that versus starting with form and functionality and then trying to uh, manifest the emotional output so to speak exactly and, and it's quite hard to do that in, in product design you know to, to if you're if you're talking about a product but you know if you're talking about experience design whatever part we're talking about today in sort of a modern commercial reality is like uh 
you know, it's it's easy to build an app. It's easy to build a site. It's easy to, you know, import stuff from somewhere and, you know, create a business. But to have people have an emotional connection with that and, you know, connected to purpose, which I think we'll probably talk about on this chat a little bit, is uh, that's a whole different level that, uh, you know, um, that, you know, we need to be more aware of, I think, particularly as, as Muslim communities and creatives and startup founders uh is uh is you know so there's a strong relationship between all those things and I think design is a is a thread that we should embrace across those. On your website, you you talk a lot about you know you give a lot of great advice to entrepreneurs and artists and 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 the likes. And one thing that struck me was this idea of purpose and creativity being connected for you. And I'd love to hear more your your thoughts about that and what that really means. Yeah, so I mean, I think everyone's on this journey, right? And and having the you know, and I, I really like that Rumi phrase that, you know, there are as many paths to God as there are souls on earth. I'm probably paraphrasing badly, um, you know, the original uh, Farsi or <laughs> whatever it was. But um, I, I find that, you know, Hamla reflecting back on, you know, 10, 15 years of, of being Muslim and being a creative professional. And I was, you know, I was doing freelance design before I was Muslim. Uh, and, but I've seen this stronger and stronger sort of... Um, uh, you know, interconnection between the two for me. So my spiritual journey is linked to the creative journey, and and just having this, um, you know, this this awareness of like, hey, you're not actually creating much. You're you're literally just trying to channel this inspiration that you're being given. Um, and this, when you get things like a feeling of flow, where you can work quickly, and it just kind of comes from this place. Like to me, that's just there. There's signs from from God that you know you're you're channeling this from somewhere. It's not like you're sitting there, you know, actively thinking how you're going to draw this thing or create this thing. Some inspiration is coming, and so that's one example. But there there are many of how the spirituality and creativity are, are so deeply connected. Right. No, I, I I can totally resonate with that. It's true. I mean, sometimes you just feel this powerful charge or surge you know, to do something. Um, and you don't always recognize where you're getting the fuel and energy from, right? But it's happening. And I, I can relate to that idea as almost like you're a vehicle that's transferring something that is meant to manifest, right, in the temporal world. Um, and that's kind of the sense I got by what you mean by creativity and how this is connected to purpose. Because if we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and designed us, we all have, of course, an ultimate purpose as well as a particular purpose, which is the personal gifts we're going to give, right? Um, and that's one of the ways that maybe the divine guides us or shows us what our calling is all about. Because you're going to be better at some things than other things naturally, and that's the case for for pretty much everybody. Beautifully said. And then, isn't it amazing that there's just enough people on the planet that seem to be able to have enough of what what's needed? So why why is it that you know you were born to have a gift of you know helping people, talking to people, listening, and you know having a podcast and having a passion for that? And and I have you know I've maybe been blessed with the skills of you know, being able to, you know, design this thing or work on this thing or lead a creative team. But someone else is really passionate about numbers and accounting and, you know, making, being the glue of the whole thing together. And someone else is passionate about, like, um, you know, designing infrastructure and roads and making sure people can safely move around. But I'm like, that sounds super right. boring to me. <laughs> you know, like, that, that's, like, that's, again, another sign that this, that this whole thing is being designed in some way, um, this whole kind of, you know, ecosystem around us. These are these are the signs for those that reflect. I think. I mean, for me, that's how I one of them that I read as well is how it's amazing. There's just seemed enough of people. You know, when you see that, when you have like you have Mashallah, a young child, and I have three. You see, each each kid comes kind of pre-packaged with this software that keeps upgrading and unfolding, and they keep learning and trying, and you know, and and you see how they just have this. They're drawn to certain things. You know, where does that come from? Like, that's incredible to me. How does that, you know, each kid's so different as well. It's like one kid is definitely Mac OS, you know, High Sierra. The other kid's running Linux, some hacked version of Linux. And they're like running completely the way they different think and interact with the world and things they're interested in. Uh, it's um, it's fascinating just to observe this stuff. Right. You know what also comes up for me, and, and maybe you have some of your own thoughts and observations. What's sad sometimes, Peter, is... Sometimes in the name of religious purpose, we stunt our creativity. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that, that comment. 
Yes, 100%. And I think many would agree, like there's probably people listening here like nodding their head and they can relate to some specific thing. Like maybe they went to a Muslim school where, you know, just a lot of the visual arts and creative arts were not encouraged or sometimes even discouraged, you know, like, or, you know, the art, it's even happens a lot to this day where, you know, in many sort of educational environments, unfortunately, in, in Muslim communities around the world, um, you know, art is considered, oh, okay, you can do calligraphy or nasheed, maybe, like that sort of, and like, that's incredibly limiting when you think about the, the you know, our beautiful creative legacy, our heritage, of this, this richness that was always there and always evolving and always learning, adapting, borrowing great bits of culture and instrumentation and, you know, the tools. So, you know, when Qawwali music becomes popular in, you know, in modern day Pakistan and, you know, you know, the, some of the, you know, the musical instruments that, that are the core part of that, you know, came from other places. So I, I can talk at length about this. I don't want to sound like I'm giving a big khutbah about uh, creativity, <laughs> but I can, I can talk at length about my own experiences and what I hear from others. No, this is important. Please unpack it. This is really important because as someone who considers himself artistic and always been a fan of, of creative arts, I definitely want to hear your opinion about this because I've worked in schools for five years. Um, I grew up obviously in the United States. I've, I've visited several communities and I definitely can, can confirm some of these concerns, right? And so I'd love to hear more about, you know, what you'd like to say here about creativity and how sometimes our religious prerogatives or um, – you know, misplaced prerogatives uh, can stunt creativity, right? Yeah, well, I think uh, rather than go on a big rant, which which I could easily do and bore everyone to tears, I, I, I'll say that we have to look at... Um, we have to look at what, what's around us and what, what things are, what, what types of tools and creative tools and techniques are affecting people and influencing people. And obviously, obvious ones are, um, and, and also many of them negatively, like, you know, so much of the, you know, music, you know, that, that is, you know, quote unquote music that's just kind of pushed in this very manufactured way. There's so much negativity in that. I don't think anyone would really argue that. But um, that you can't then just say, well, that is an entire channel of you know, connection is, is shut off to young people um, and they're going to push back on you. you. You can't do that. And historically, Muslims haven't, haven't done that. My understanding, although I never claim to be a scholar or anyone of, of real knowledge. Um, but if you, if you look at someone like Dr. Omar Abdullah and you read his cultural imperative um, or you, you know, see one of his talks about the cultural imperative, right. you'll understand that Muslims have always had strong cultural tools that basically, no, not cultural tools, when Islam came, he describes it, it was like, you know, the clear water and it would always reflect the colors of the bedrock underneath. So Islam in China looks Chinese. You look at the architecture, the mosque, the music, the way, you know, the prophet was referred to the great sage, Salah um, You know, you, you, you see, um, you know, Islam is super Chinese, just, you know, and, and, and uh, the same in many other places. You know, Islam, when it comes to Java and Malaya, um, you know, shadow puppets are used as, a, as tools to communicate stories of the Sira, you know, using these uh, creative, you know, like puppet shows, <laughs> now, which I think is, which is awesome. And of course, you know, Indonesia now is the biggest Muslim uh, country in, in the world in terms of just if you're looking at Muslims as numbers. So um, I just feel like I, I get sort of, I feel like, you know, why are we not embracing our creativity, our imaginative ability that, you know, God or Allah has given us all imagination. We're all creative. We all have dreams. Um, you know, we all have things we think about and contemplate. Why are we denying those things? You know, another guy, uh, Dr. Samir Mahmoud, um, talks about khayal, spiritual imagination, and worship, worship Allah as if you see him. And th th there's a whole sort of think, thinking about as if being, well, you have some level of imagination there. That doesn't mean like, you know, don't create a form, you know, what you're trying to say, oh, Allah looks like this. No, we're saying like as if is, you know, as if you see him is, you know, having some imaginative creative capacity. So that has to come straight into our schools, our uh, educational kind of, um, you know, projects and, and programs. Uh, and, I've, you know, I've spent a bit of time trying to work on some of those those things. But I feel like I should cool it down because I'm going to get really... Uh, I'm going to get <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up Peter. I was actually my follow-up comment was going to say I think it's so imperative to have creative systems in our communities and organizations because exactly that point you can't have optimized iman and faith in my opinion if you don't have optimized imagination because think about it 
you have to reflect and ponder stories of the Qur'an. Storytelling requires imagination and visualization. So if the only way we're going to be able to make that connection and fill that gap is through the human power of imagination. And so I find that this can be even a correlation with people later in life losing faith or not having a, a, an optimized um, sense of it because they were stunted in their imaginative capacity. I totally agree, and in fact, the the um, if you look, even if even if people are skeptical, or they they have this sort of hesitation, or they have this sort of fear. Like you know, if you if you open that hood up a little bit and see, well, why is there there's this fear? You know, and if they're saying, oh, well, that's not really what our faith is about. Um, you know, just go back and, and unpack some of the the thinking. So, for example, like calligraphy, which they you know Muslims over the world appreciate it didn't just arrive in a box and say here is calligraphy it was always evolving and adapting and changing and if you look at the, the original qurans and then you look at them 50 years later or 100 years later all the way through centuries all the way to the you know Uthmani, ottoman you know very very highly sophisticated um courts of calligraphy you know that process took you know centuries to to evolve and learn and adapt as well and pick up things on the way and be creative and build and you know in, in today's language you'd say you know prototype you know fail forward fail fast you know like keep evolving and, and learning and adapting and um you know in, in many other you know in architecture of course in, in those traditional islamic arts it didn't just come in a box and like here you go here is islam and here is islamic art and culture no it it, 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 all, it always was growing and so my point is, and I'm obviously even late to the conversation, you know, having only checked this stuff out in the last decade or so, is, um, well, it keeps going now. It doesn't just stop. So what are we doing about when talking about um, the language of today is, um, you know, it's digital technology, it's apps, maybe it's VR, um, may, maybe it's certain interactive experiences. Um, what, how are we embracing those tools for good and not just simply saying, well, that's just, you know, technology is bad and that's new. We don't do that. I don't imagine the the Ottomans would come across the VR and just say, uh, I don't know, let's just run away and never ignore it. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's maybe it's a silly comparison, but it's just we we got to um, we got to encourage our communities to to just really be open and, and and excited about creative potential of things going forward. And music and art and literature aren't inherently just things we we ignore. We have to em- embrace them as tools for good quite desperately. Um, you know, look at Yusuf Islam. He was in Sydney just a couple of weeks ago. We caught up briefly. And he was, um, you go to his concerts and, and you see that, um, you know, 30,000 people at a time in Australia are hearing about the Sira or hearing about um, the beauty of, of the message. And But but but, but done in, the, in, a, in a way that is, um, you know, accessible and enjoyable and appreciated by, you know, the local Australian communities and many others in, in North America and, and wherever he goes. Um, you know, that is a, that's a great message for us. And he's doing great, great work, just, you know, you know, building bridges and connecting people and opening them up because he understands the, the beauty and power of that music for good. So we, we have to be open to these channels, I think. Right, right. And again, Islamic history is evident with some of the most beautiful forms of art that humans admire today. You know, so obviously there was this this aspect of the culture um, amongst many different Muslim societies that were expressing uh, art, right, in all these different forms. I kind of like to see art. Tell me what you think of this, Peter. I feel like art is a means for the soul to translate, um, to release, and to cleanse existential energy, or to communicate what is beyond the cognitive so to speak, right? Because that's why sometimes you can experience a piece of art or listen to music or even see some kind of digital design and it speaks to you in a way that maybe words wouldn't in the same fashion, right? So I really see it as a, it's like a type of technology or a gift of the soul to translate existential energy mm. and meaning yes. that sometimes is yes. beyond the cognitive. What are your thoughts? Mm. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, that's that's a beautiful definition and explanation, and and different people will will sort of understand that um, depending on you know how like that's sort of let's say a, a technical you know way of, of even describing it, and, and that's fine and it's good. And another way that I sometimes think about is art is about asking questions, and I think design design is about solving problems and so in solving you know maybe some of those questions. Um, 
and, and I think the, the simplicity in that is, yeah, art, art is a, and it doesn't need a commercial context, whereas design often does. It, need, it's a, it needs people, you know, whereas art, I feel like the true artists, if they were, you asked me that question about being on an island, you know, if they had their art, they were creating art, even if people aren't around to just, you know, ask the questions or whatever, it's in them, they have to do it. It's like it's, they're channeling it and they're like, that's the question they were meant to bring up. And, uh, you know, design needs, you know, people. It's solving the needs of people. It's, it's, it's sort of, you know, trying to improve something or make a process better or some experience better. Uh, and so, um, sorry to bring design into it again, but, but uh, it's my, um, it is, yeah. It's all interconnected, yeah. But this kind of brings me to another um, topic that I wanted to pick your brain about. So, you know, in all the wonderful content you share amongst them, you have this idea of creating from the heart, um, creating from the heart. Now, what's what's the difference between, let's say, creating from one's heart versus creating from one's head? Is that a distinction that you, you feel that you, you'd like to share with us? And what does it mean to create from the heart exactly? But maybe you can offer some examples at the end of your response. I think the, the people that create from the heart, they, they know what I'm talking about. And, and you know, and, and in fact, all of us have done something where we just feel that you know you feel deeply connected to it, and you get you get some kind of flow into it. You know where um, I can't pronounce the guy's name properly. I think it's Chiselnitsky that talks about flow, right? And and I've I come this comes up and up again in different books I read and so on. Uh, and and you see this across people that you know let's say don't really don't believe in God or don't have any of that sort of you know religious framework. They still describe this sense of flow where something they're channeling something. And it's usually after, you know, they've been doing it for a certain amount of time, but they just feel like, you know, they, they want to keep doing that practice, um, that creative practice, whatever it is. That's, that's creating from heart, your heart when you get to that point where you just, it's just coming and you're putting, you know, you're just in, and you just love doing that and time will pass quickly. And then, you know, you've, you've done it. And, and for Muslims, I think that's deeply linked to their intention. So they'll, you know, they'll, they'll have the, you know, their niya, bismillah, and they'll, they're doing something that it connects to their purpose. You know, they feel like this art they're doing. They might be, say, you know, I have a friend, Sophia, she makes beautiful soap, right? She's a soap maker. <laughs> but, you know, she does it with such heart and, and, and love. And you see that it comes through in the product, the way she talks about it, the way she, you know, people resonate with that. And they won't do the same thing with, um, you know, a, 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 you know, like a, a, a a soda, you know, which uh, is just like, you know, that's not creating from the heart. That's just, you know, manufacturing to make a, you know, a, a, you know, a need and a profit. And they will try and build a brand story. They'll try to create an artificial emotional connection. And sometimes it works. So why is it that we think about Coke one way and Pepsi another when they're the same thing, really? Like they're both that sort of fizzy black liquid soda stuff. Um, but, you know, over years of creating this emotional brand sort of story, we, we have sort of a different you know, understanding. Um, but the, 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 the things that really resonate with people, authentic, you know, meaningful, beautifully designed, you know, things or, or experiences or places, like you walk into the Alhambra or the Blue Mosque or something, you know, they were, they're created from the heart. Like you, it's, you feel it, you, you feel something special about it. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like, it, yeah, it has to feel right, not just look right. And what kind of came up for me, too, with this kind of finesse and um, pre precision, so to speak, in, in generating your product or, or whatever gift you're trying to give is, of course, this concept of ihsan, right? Doing things to the to the most excellent uh, that you can, right? Um, do, do you feel like that's also connected? This idea of creating from the heart has to do with also generating ihsan within yourself and showing it through your work or through whatever it is that you do it, it is the, the best work is the, the one that's, that's done with ahsan and with love you know muhabba or ishq you feel it and you, you feel it and has this connection and uh you know the, i think the, the challenge is in this era in this this global environment we we sort of you know interconnect with every day is can you or how can you bring that sort of same you know spiritual depth of, of meaning in in work and, and things that you're creating you know into the digital era that connects people in, in many places you know can, can you can you do that so you know I, I, this is something i'm still exploring i still think i'm you know way too inexperienced to have a you know a knowledgeable opinion but like I, I like to ask people how you know how what is islamic art to you and what what does it mean and for some people for some kid in Aceh in jakarta you know it's spraying uh with graffiti on his wall like you know the names of god and creating this kind of you know cool 
super modern type of um, expression. You know, for other people, it, it's a much more narrow, limited thing. It has to be linked to certain practices that have been traditionally always done. And, you know, scholars will say, well, this is Islamic art. It's, you know, it's mosaic tiling or it's calligraphy or it's this and this and this. Um, I'm interested in, like, well, can you bring a certain amount of that love and a certain amount of that ehsan into um, digital products and, and creative experiences and, um, you know, and, and apps and, and even, say, toys and games for kids. Can you bring that into something that's mass manufactured in China? I mean, I don't know. It's a reality. I'm trying to see if we can. Of course, I'm, I'm never going to compare, like, the Alhambra, you know, experience in, in, in Spain to, you know, something that's mass manufactured in a factory. You, you can, of course. But if someone's using, say, for example, we're working on a, you know, a wearable technology that helps Muslims, um, you know, track their prayer and coach them and improve their prayer, inshallah. Now, if we, if, if we build that in a way that it does help people, and, you know, we are taking our time to try and build it right and design it right and, and get the right features in it right, um, you know, it's very hard. It takes time, a lot of prototyping, a lot of feeling. But um, I want to put my heart into that. I want to make sure that product is right so when people put it on, and they feel this thing is helping them on their journey that connects them to their purpose, not simply just, you know, like they're thirsty, they need a drink, or they need, you know, they decide they want to wear purple sneakers instead of white, you know. Uh, but, you know, try to connect with their goals and aspirations through design, through product. You know, that's the, uh, that's kind of my purpose right now in life, I think, is trying to answer some of those questions, inshallah. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that response. Now, mashallah, you know, I know you're a humble guy, but you're a very successful individual, and I really look up to you. Like I told you before, I think you're Jimmy Page to rock and roll. Um, you're you're the Jimmy Page to design and, and brand development for me. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I am going to embarrass you. So just own it and receive the compliment, inshallah. But may Allah keep you humble and continue to grow you. Amen. But with that said, I'd love to pick your brain, Peter, about Look, nobody becomes successful overnight, right? It takes time and you have to fail and make mistakes along the way. And I'm sure you have your experiences around that. Now, how, what have you learned from your failures in life or the things you could have done better? How can some of these lessons be tied into the spiritual journey in your opinion? Alhamdulillah. So uh, there have been many. There continue to be many on a regular basis. And uh, alhamdulillah, I've, I've now embraced that as, as part of the, the journey. And I, I, um, uh, it's even still, though, there's still things, you know, you wish to work. Even after all this time where I think I sort of have an idea of what I'm doing and how things work, things, you know, inevitably, you know, more learning comes to you. You know, you're being more, pu you're more purified. You know, I'm not going to say you keep failing, but you keep... Um, you keep learning and growing, and uh, I like to think that's just going to be now, uh, you know, a part of who I am for, for life. If I still have this passion to try and bring change into the world, or, you know, then it, you know, part of that is failing and trying things out, prototyping, prototyping life. Even it's not just prototyping, you know, designs and products and, and whatever. It's prototyping your lifestyle and seeing. Well, I've tried this for a while. That didn't really work. Actually, it was a horrible failure, embarrassingly. But it did give me um, better understanding of how I do it next time. And in this, this great time, um, before I go into my own stories, there's so many great stories out there. So, for example, in the book Creativity Inc., um, the, it's about Pixar and uh, you know who make Toy Story and all these fantastic um, films. And uh, they they hired they worried after Toy Story. And I think Toy Story 2 that they're just because I had these great successes, they were um, they were like gonna you know they were feeling nervous about the third one. And what do we do? How do we find the, the the you know how do we find help? And they're like so the guy they ended up hiring um, and I'm you might have to fact check exactly, but it, the the lesson is that the guy they hired had had a string of like terrible failures in in films and people were like why would you hire this guy? He's had like f four of his films have failed. You're on, you you know Pixar is the height of success about to launch your next next thing, and and they said well because this guy has the most learning and he knows what not to do in this area. And the the film they made was Finding Nemo, if I'm correct. You know it comes out wow. with this you know this creative thing and. Um, you know, that's the principle. And you hear this time and time again in entrepreneurship circles. So I've had my own share of that. Definitely, I haven't created Finding Nemo, but I have had, you know, a number of little steps along the way. Um, one, for example, where I, you know, I put my heart and soul into creating this set of artwork and I took it to, um, this is, you know, only a few years after I became Muslim. I was like, yeah, I'm going to create, uh, you know, digital Islamic art. It's I, I, I can't find much of it around. I can't see it much online. Um, so I created his work and I put a lot of time in and I made all the artwork and the prints 
and uh, I took it to like the community eat fair. I'm like, oh, people are gonna love this, you know? Like, look, it's like a lot, but it's done more creatively and colorfully. It's breaking away from that black and gold stuff that's just made out of plastic that everyone seems to have in their house. And like, it didn't work. People were like, uh, I don't know, like, yeah, I'm not, sh- I'm not so sure. And I was kind of like crushed. I was like, oh, you know, but it, it looks so good. And I was like, okay, well, you know what? I'm gonna just, I gotta try again, right? So I tried it the next year. I waited, you know, because I was still freelancing design, but I was working on this Islamic art stuff, and and I thought um, I put it out again, and I created all this stuff, and I thought, okay, this is cool, people are gonna love it, and it, again, it didn't, it didn't work well. I was like, oh, what's happening? And I realized that, and I said, on the third year, that's it, Bismillah. I made a few changes, and the third year, I'm going to, I said, all right, I'm just going to um, give it my best. If it doesn't work, that's it. I'm done with whole Islamic art and design. I'm just, I'm, you know, halas. I tried halas. And uh, Hamla, the third year, I sold out of everything, every single piece of thing that I bought. <laughs> and what I realized that it wasn't so much the, the art and the expression, but it was the sort of way I was making it available, the way I was doing the prints and the canvases and stuff like that. The, the actual, the, the, you know, the sort of the, the actual, um, you know, the experience of buying it and putting it up on people's walls wasn't good, even though people liked some of the ideas. So that was just one tiny, but there's been many. Um, another quick one I'll just share, which is sort of relevant right now, is so I put out, um, I did a little bit of crowdfunding about uh, a few years ago, four years ago, for um, some ideas on apps that I had and for kids. And a humble lot of people love the idea. We got the support. Um, it, it all went well. We kind of built them. Um, and, and it got some great feedback on them. But there was a lot of things that I, I wasn't aware of in terms of what I really need to do to scale them and grow them and having the right tech team and everything. So it didn't go to the level I was sort of hoping. But what it did do is started getting us more projects and attention in that same space for you know, you know creative Islamic kids content, digital stuff. And Humble, we got a whole bunch of projects with some you know really well-known people in the space. And then um, and then now Humble Salam Sisters as a brand. Um, as of last year, I sort of teamed up, you know, brought my company into a bigger team uh, with some support and investment, and, and we're, we've turned to our sisters, at humble now, into a, a complete doll, right, doll line, a range of like physical products with books and toys and games and stories, and they have, you know, augmented reality integration, um, and you know, beautiful packaging and stories that inspire and empower kids. So. The first time I, ha- I sort of got the concept right, but not the not the execution. And I, you know, this this time now, humbler, we're trying to get the we, you know once the dolls are ready this year. Um, you know, you can see prototypes on on my website. Uh, inshallah, we'll you know we want them to be reached out. To, we want them to be you know enjoyed by kids all around the world as you know these beautiful uh, dolls that you can um, you know fully interact with. So that's one failure that is I wouldn't say a success yet because we haven't you know fully launched it. I feel already successful because we're getting great feedback and inspirational um, comments from moms and kids and parents saying, oh, we love this. We can't wait to get it. You know, these look beautiful. And my kids you know, want to play with them. I feel that um, it's on the road to success. So beautiful. inshallah, we'll get there. We'll get there. No, mashallah, that's great. Uh, and I, I'm aware of that project and it looks amazing how, where it's come. So we'll definitely have a link to your site so people can check all that stuff out. That's just a, such a great example of how, you know, one of my favorite acronyms that I learned along the way was FAIL means forever acquiring important lessons. Yeah, nice. Yeah. It's not, it's not always a negative thing, right? And I also heard you say that one thing you've learned is that you never stop learning. And that is really one of the major keys to success is that you recognize there's no finish line. There's always more growth, more skills, more knowledge to be had. And how will you ever receive it if you've already decided, I don't need any more? The glass is full. Absolutely agree. Uh, and we, you know, all the people around us that we probably consider successful or, um, you know, are really trying to bring some change into the world uh, that are, you know, through their, their, their startups or their organizations or whatever they're working on. Um, you'll find they're always learning. You know, not everyone, you know, takes that to mean you're, you know, reading a book every single day. Uh, other people, you know, they, they learn, but they're, they're, you don't get stuck and get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm done. I you know, I know. Like, no, you can. You know, the search is worth without end. You know, Allah is infinite. Uh, and of course, you know, in terms of daily temporal stuff, we're trying to learn how to be, you know, better designers, better creators, better podcasters, <laughs> as well as trying to be better husbands, better fathers you know, better, better sons, like, you know, um, you, you, that's it. That's, that's our mission is just learn, learn, learn. And sometimes it's hard, you know, in fact, you know, it's uh, definitely not meant to be easy. If it's super easy, you're doing it wrong. That's what they say, right? All those entre- entrepreneurs. <laughs> um, 
And I tried some formal study last year or two after a big break since university. Um, and I did, I did a course that um, it was actually honestly really hard to do after trying to man manage like family and, and work and growing businesses and trying things. But humbly, I finished it uh, last year, the course, and, and went and did a graduation and everything. And I was like, Alhamdulillah, like, you know, I, I, it, was, it just felt so good to be able to, to do that and, and keep learning throughout the whole process of this, this journey. Right. Step by step. Perhaps that's why, you know, ver patience is, is the first and last virtue, because without it, you're not going to gain any of the other ones. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Uh, can you just remind me of that every week when I'm getting frustrated about something that's not working? You need to like <laughs> just WhatsApp me right out of the room and say like, Peter, you know, like, in there, like just send it to me every every week. I need that, you know, so uh, that's it. bro. You got it. Of course, anything I can do to help, of course. So, Peter, I, I definitely um, want to get a couple of questions in from our listeners. So those of you um, who aren't patrons yet of the Coffee with Kareem podcast, go check out patreon.com slash coffee with Kareem. Support this podcast. Help me be able to put these amazing shows together and be able to speak to guests like Peter. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you from our patrons. And uh, when you become a patron, ladies and gentlemen, you can ask questions too for my upcoming guests. So join us today. So one question I have here, Peter, is does Peter have intentions to grow his inspirational site, creativeumma.com, into something more? Alhamdulillah, um, great question. And thank you for asking a hundred percent yes. I mean, there, Hamla, uh, over the last few years in these, you know, experiments and projects, um, I've really tried to have what, um, you know, designers or entrepreneurs encourage you to have, which is a bias to action, where rather than just thinking and planning and reflecting and, ho and hoping you'll get to something, just basically like, try to start building stuff with the right intention and, and, and inshallah see what can happen. So creativeumma.com, who for those who haven't come across it yet, um, is a project that's it's, it's inspired, it, the idea is to inspire and encourage uh, you know, emerging or aspiring uh, Muslim creatives and entrepreneurs. And it's had already in the last, I think, four years or, th you know, three years or so, uh, you know, probably three different um, versions of itself. So it started out, our intention was to have a kind of like a, basically, a, it was very ambitious and we were probably way too naive into sort of the scale of what's needed. Basically, a, 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 a site where you could, any anyone with, you know, skill or talent could learn and share through video um, courses, e-learning courses, and you know, little mini communities, their skills. So it might be calligraphy or podcasting, or um, you know, some sort of creative practice, or you know, working with how do you, you know, establish creative, or, you know, sort of. Um, that was the sort of the intent. We realized that okay, that's pretty ambitious. So we sort of pivoted that into the next version, which is more about let's just tell the stories of all of these um, great entrepreneurs and creatives and you know, Muslim communities that we're finding and put together lists and so on. That was cool. And and to this day, humble, there's still a lot of traffic and people like you know sort of um, seeking that content. But what we found was, to be honest, there were like you know at least three other sites doing a, doing a probably a better job at that in terms of like well resourced, really well focused you know, creating better sort of content, you know, well, you know, sort of with the, the regular, you know, building, building um, really good processes and, and with more journalistic kind of, um, you know, expertise and intent. So we kind of let them, we kind of realize, okay, that's not our model. So what I decided to do late last year, um, or sort of mid last year as a, as a team um, to, okay, let's really pare it down to the essence. What are we really trying to do? What do we want to do with this site? Um, what was its original goal? And it was just that, was inspire and encourage Muslim entrepreneurs and, and creatives. And so I, I went and asked a bunch of people, okay, in the simplest possible way, in one paragraph or one sentence or whatever, what, what advice can you give in this area? And just to really pare it down, and, and alhamdulillah, we did that. We just, we just completely simplified the, the, the model. And I asked people I knew that have had incredible success or, and failure in their journey, and so the, the, there's only a handful of posts there now, but we're adding those monthly. Um, and Kareem, of course, you'd be a great one to, to add there. Um, you know, just what advice would you share? Very simple concept. But to come back to the reader's question or the listener's question, yeah, I'd love to grow it still. I'd love to keep adding. And please uh, send us, you know, your input and feedback. And uh, it's, it is still kind of like a side project among many others that I'm, I'm trying to run as a, as a studio. And um, it needs its haq. It needs its, its, its time and its people to really get to the level it should be. 
and uh, I appreciate you, the person asking that question. Alhamdulillah. Excellent, excellent. Great. And another question we have from one of our patrons. Meaningful stories are powerful, Peter. How can one come up with one for their brand if they don't have one? How do you give a brand meaning? Great, great question. So, okay, I'm going to answer in a, a very real way, if it's okay. If it's all right with that person, forgive me if it's too, too no, real. No, 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 I prefer, I prefer <laughs> fake way. Fake, fake way? way? <laughs> no, it's going to be the real way. <laughs> the real way is um, that should be at the very heart of, your, of, your, of what you're doing. Um, if, you, if you have a business where you're trying to find uh, a business or an idea where you're trying to find the right story and, and purpose around it that, to try and, you know, let's say, um, I know it's a strong word, but if you were trying to manufacture an emotional connection to that brand or product or story. So let's say I'm walking around on the streets right now, and, and forgive me, um, reader, uh, listeners, for if you hear all this background noise, but let's say your business is like, okay, I'm going to sell... Um, uh, you know, a custom thing that goes around number of plates on cars, right? You know, those license plate things um, or whatever. If, you, if that's your thing. Now, it's going to be really hard to get people to emotionally connect with that unless you find that, you know, there's something really funny or relevant to that area or story. Like, it's, it's going to be a stretch. But we are very, very fortunate and blessed in this Muslim community um, that, uh, you know, the, the, the stuff, the connections we're trying to create – often through our products in the Islamic economy startups, um, are very relevant and meaningful. So, you know, some of them are like helping people focus on prayer better or track your prayer. Others are like trying to, you know, trying to find your, your life partner. Others are, you know, like I want to, um, you know, dress a certain way to reflect my, you know, spiritual and lifestyle aspirations. And that connects with people in a meaningful way because you have products and services that align with that, you know, that person's intentions for life, what they're trying to do, their whole life purpose um, so I would say to that person to come back to it is rather than try to create a story, uh, you know, around that, you, you know, the, the, the thing you're trying to do itself should be inherently really strong. And then you need to find ways to tell the story as, as, as good as possible so that people emotionally connect to it and they see it clearly and simply, oh, OK, so, you know, you're designing or, or trying to sell this thing. Great. That solves this problem that I have. And it's not a problem of like simple things like maybe, oh, I want to buy a coffee better or get a, you know, get an Uber across town. It's something that's meaningful to that person, probably spiritually, which is very deep. And, um, you know, as long as you're doing that with the right intention, it can be very powerful. Um, you know, like it, it's also possible for people to probably another whole other conversation of, you know, to create a, um, uh, you know, to, to manipulate people in the wrong way through, through their faith. I think that there's a danger of that happening. I don't want to sort of go down that path now, but I've, I'm sure your listeners wouldn't be doing that. But it's just, you know, being aware of, of uh, you know, th that person's emotional sort of their aspirations in life and creating a strong story that links and makes them resonate simply, effectively, beautifully. Uh, the same way all these big advertisers try to do that. But we can actually do it with something that actually is meaningful and relevant to our, to our lives. Inshallah. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Peter. Well, we're going to have to have you on again soon because I think there's a lot more things that we can unpack and I want to pick your brain on. But I know you're a busy man. Your uh, coffee is coming to an end, I'm sure, <laughs> yeah. or it's already done. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> pretty, pretty much done. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And uh, it was great to, to chat with you as I was wandering the streets of Sydney here. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate uh, what you're doing. Karen. Thanks so much for reaching out. Akramakam Allah, Peter. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have the link there below in the description. And please visit patreon.com slash coffee with Kareem to continue to support this show. Kareem Sirajuddin here. Thank you for tuning in. Please visit nurhuman.com to learn more about how I provide personal, spiritual, and relationship counsel and growth. Don't forget to visit coffeewithkareem.com to see the latest news and updates about this podcast. Please generously help sponsor the show to keep on going at patreon.com slash coffeewithkareem. That's patreon.com slash coffeewithkareem.